Shallow water mutton snappers, welcome to the Good Karma Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Ryan Van Fleet. Okay, guys, this is the bonus podcast for the week. I appreciate you tuning in. So here we go. Okay, first, this is my style of fishing. And like I said in the past, what I do may not work for you. Okay, so please keep that in mind as I go through this podcast. Now, I do the same thing every day when I'm out there patchery fishing for mutton snappers. And I've been doing this, I've been doing what I'm going to talk to you guys about for years now, and I've just modified it a little bit. And every time I go out there, I learn a little bit more. And as I learn a little bit more, I study it a little bit more out there, and, and I try to put together the pieces because that's what makes it fun for me, okay? And it helps develop my instincts even more. So, but that's something I'll talk about in the future, is how to how to build your instincts because that's what makes you what that's what makes a great fisherman a great fisherman is the instincts to, that he has to know where to be at the right time and what to do to catch these fish and how to adjust. Okay, so my pat reef trips are five hours long. Okay, and what I mean by five hours long, I'm just not taking the, my clients out there. And, and billing them for time traveled either. It, they're five hours, okay? Because sometimes that's what it takes to catch fish on half days. You got to spend a little bit of time. This four hour, these four hour trips on the patches, that's not enough time for a charter. It's not. So I, my trips are five hours and that's five hours of fishing time. If, we, if the clients are burnt out, most of the time they're burnt out after five hours on the patches because we catch a lot of fish. But you got to put the time in is what I'm saying. And it's not fair to my client to take them out patchery fishing if I don't give them the time to catch fish. Because targeting big muttons on the patchries requires time. It requires time and patience. And a lot of people nowadays, they don't have patience. That's, I'm just seeing it and seeing it. And more and more, and when I have those type of people on my charters, I know I'm not going to catch many fish because they irritate you when they get on their watches. And then the new thing is they try to text back and forth. Oh, we're not catching anything. So they don't have to talk in front of me. And it's, just, it's a new thing that's happening that the other guides are seeing. So a good guide has really good instincts, not only about the fish, about his clients and how they're feeling. So believe me, the guy doesn't need you to on a patch uh, on any sort of trip to start looking at your watch and start harassing him about when the fish are going to bite. So it's it's super challenging getting big muttons to bite on the patch reefs in really good numbers, guys. So if you're with a guide or if you're going by yourself with your buddies, you got to coach them and let them know what's, how it's going to work. And that's what I do. So that's my first step is that I talk to my clients about how it's going to work. And nine out of 10 times, it always works out like that. So when I get to the patch, I get the chum out and I get the spot going. We start off with really light spinning rods and shrimp. And... I let them catch as many fish as they can, okay? As many fish as they can. And with shrimp, you know, I bring 20 dozen shrimp and they're gone. Okay, so once we burn through and they burn out, most of the time the clients just burn out after about 10 to 12, 15 dozen shrimp. They're, they're burn out. Now, how do I know that the muttons are there, okay? When my clients start catching smaller mutton snappers in good numbers on those light spinning rods, then I know that mama muttons are there. I know that they're there because when the smaller muttons show up in good numbers, the bigger ones, eight out of 10 times, are hanging back, okay? Now, the bigger fish are picky. They're picky. Now, sometimes you can get them on the chunk, and in the future, I'll talk a little bit about the chunk, and then sometimes you can get them on the shrimp, and sometimes you just get lucky and catch them on a piece of rotten dead bait if they're really stupid and hungry. So, but live bait is the trick to catch big mutton snappers on the patchries. Now, certain patch reefs I've seen mutton snappers that will gobble up pilchards versus bally, live ballyhoo. So it's really bizarre how it works, but on certain patches I've seen these certain fish eat different types of bait. Now, 
who the hell knows why, but I just know that if I'm going to go fish a, one patch, I better have live pilchers versus live ballyhoo. It's just really bizarre. But So that's another tip for you. Having a variety of different baits, just depending on what you're seeing. But nine, you know, it just... I've, what I see is that maybe earlier in the season, they really go earlier in the, in the fall, they really go after the big giant pilchards versus the ballyhoo on certain patches, and then it flips. Now, right now, I would consider the, the mutton's top bait on the patch reefs are the ballyhoo, okay? So about the ballyhoo and what I do. Now, the first thing you got to do is you got to get while you're catching while you're while you're catching fish on shrimp and you know having a good time you got to get the ballyhoo in you got to get them in that requires a lot of chumming sometimes guys and i don't like i just laugh and, and you know until i like i just laugh and i hear you don't want to use a lot of chum and because that draws in the trash fish and man and it draws in the sharks hey man Shark fishing and mutton snapper fishing, it goes hand in hand, especially on the wrecks. So some days you're going to get really lucky and there's not going to be any sharks there, but all muttons. Now, big mama mutton, nine times out of 10, those little sharks aren't going to mess around with big mama mutton and big mama mutton is going to kick away those small sharks and get that bait before those little sharks do. But it's all part of it. It's all part of it. So... You just got to like, it's like anything else. You just got to keep going. One day you're going to like hit it big with the muttons. And then the next day you're going to have nothing but sharks. It is what it is. But this whole bunch of, the bunch of bullshit about not using a bunch of chum on the patries, that's a bunch of crap. Okay. So you need to use a lot of chum on the patries if you're going to do some serious mutton snapper fishing because you need to get all that bait in there, okay? You've all seen those videos of those big mutton snappers crashing all those ballyhoo, those commercial guys that are catching the ballyhoo, and you guys have seen them up in northern Key Largo where they're crashing, the big mutton snappers are crashing all those ballyhoo. That's what you're trying to create, okay? You're trying to create that natural feeding frenzy, and you see it happen, if you can get all those, a uh, bunch of ballyhoo behind your boat, I know that big mama mutton's back there because I can see them crashing the bait way back there. And I'm like, dang. So that's when I say, okay, guys, it's time to, are you guys ready to start targeting mutton snappers? Now, the first thing I tell them is it's, it's going to be a little boring, okay? Because sometimes these fish will... Once you put out a big, like, once you throw out your, your ballyhoo, and, okay, so i got to back up a little bit. So my, my standard ballyhoo rig for mutton snapper is I use 40-pound fluorocarbon, and if I've got to drop back to 30, I will, but I try just to stick with 40-pound 40, 40 fluorocarbon leader, okay? And I, I splice that. Now, that's my... You know, that's my main line is 40-pound fluorocarbon leader, and that's attached to a 40-pound braid on a big Shimano twin power spinning reel. I use 8,000s and 10,000s, 10, and I've got them paired with adrenaline live bait rods, okay? So the live bait rods are perfect for mutton snapper fishing that I have because... Why do you have to use a live bait rod? Because these the rod length, okay? You have to make really long casts because those big mutton snappers are way the hell back there in the chum slick, either off to the, the right or left side of the boat or way in the back, okay? So you got to be able to get that ballyhoo way the hell back there. And with the braid, you have to be on the rod at all times because you got to be able to put your... You got to be able to feel that big mutton snapper pick up that ballyhoo and give him a little bit of drop back, okay? So that the fish has enough time to turn the ballyhoo around and eat it head first. So I like to give it like a like a 3 to 4 count as if I go 1, 2, 3 and I let him run off the line a little bit cuz I'm fishing with the bail open, okay? And what happens is, and then I'll say go, and I let the client flip that bail down really quick, and they reel hard and fast, okay? My drags are set tight, 
And because I'm using the live bait rod that's set up and has the perfect amount of flex, it keeps the hooks intact. And I'm using giant, like when I say giant, um, circle hooks, okay? I'm using number sixes, owners, number sevens, and I'm using number eights. And I'm sizing the lead appropriately versus what the current's doing and all that good stuff. So, but, so you have to have a big rod, like when I say a big rod, a long rod, seven foot is perfect, six, six, six is perfect, and you want to be able to make really long casts. 40 pound braid works really well for me, and 40 pound fluorocarbon. 40 pound fluorocarbon is a must to get the bites in shallow water. Oh, fluorocarbon doesn't matter. Okay, you guys just keep thinking that because I'll, we're, the guys that are listening are catching more fish now since they've made the change and so have my clients. And so you guys just keep believing that. <laughs> so it's just more fish for us and the guys that are making the change and spending a little bit extra money on the fluorocarbon. But just saying. So let's back up a little bit. First, a lot of chum. You got to get your spot going. You do that by catching fish, letting your, letting your group have fun with the light tackle. And then once you start catching those smaller muttons, you know that big mama muttons are back there. And now, how do you know that how many fish are back there? Okay, so this is where it gets a little tricky. Muttons can get really spooky. Now, what I've learned over the course of the years is that you got to try to catch the first fish that hooks the bait. If you miss him, sometimes that shuts the whole school off, okay? So you got to have your best angler on the rod, and you got to hope that the fish sticks because I've seen it a number of times, and even, like, everybody knows, like, the guys that really mutton fish know that when you miss a fish, sometimes it shuts them down. If that happens, you got to sit and wait again and wait and wait for the school to come back in and get comfortable. Okay, so that means you got to put in more time. And I'm not a very good joke teller, so I'm like, I don't have a lot of like jokes to tell. <laughs> so, but I see it in my client's face. They're like, oh God, when are they going to show up again? I'm like, you got to be patient. The fish will be here. Everything's right. We missed them. Now they got to get comfortable and come back in. Now, when's that going to be? I don't know, but they usually do come back in, and once you start catching them, then that, usually about that second time when they come back, there's usually more of them from what I've seen, so they usually school up more, and then they get more ferocious, and they start eating. Now, so that's a little tip for you there. So patience, long casts, live ballyhoo. I don't like to use chunk ballyhoo on the on the um, on my mutton snapper rigs, um, I'm a live bait guy when it comes to that. Now I have caught them on chunks of ballyhoo, but they're usually smaller. And I'm looking for really like like really nice muttons, ten to fifteen pounds on the patches, and those fish tend to like the live bait more. So, but anyways, I'm kind of getting off topic a little bit. Melinda kicked my ass, so I'm gonna kind of groove back into it a little bit with it. Okay. So let's talk about time of day and tide. Tide really does mean a lot, okay? So if I'm not getting a bite right away, I'll have to look at my watch and, and look at the tides, pull it up on, the, on, the, um, on my Garmin. And I don't have a watch, by the way. I just, when I say look at my, I look at the times on my Garmin and then I look at the tides and I, cause I believe watches are unlucky. When I walked away from the corporate world, I, I swore to God I'd never wear another watch. And I don't need to wear a watch. So I think watches are bad luck when you go fishing. <laughs> but anyways, so you got to know where your tide's at. Outgoing tide, incoming tide, water quality. Time, but I think that the time of day really does make a difference. Now, let's say, for example, you get out there, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and you got a few bites, but nothing's happening. You're like, dang, it's nothing going on. Or you get like a solid flurry of, flurry of bites uh, mid-afternoon, and then everything kind of stops. This is where 
this is where patience can make or break you, depending on if you're a guide or if or or you're really passionate about being out there recreational fishing, trying to catch these big muttons. This is where you just got to be patient, okay? Because the bite, nine out of ten times, is going to happen when the sun starts to change a little bit, meaning that you're going to see the the bright sky go to a different haze, and that usually happens around two, three o'clock. And especially on a full moon phase, you'll see them start firing up again, or it could just be the tide. So I, I do think the full moon has a lot to do with it, but they bite all the time. It just sometimes they're more congregated with their spawning aggregates around the moon. And unlike a lot of what you guys think, it's like, oh, the mutton spawn this time of year and that time of year. The mutton spawn happens quite often, actually. So just in different areas. And everybody's like, well, where are the muttons at on the reef right now? Guys, the muttons are in really shallow or they're really deep. So it just depends on day to day. I catch a few in 65, 75 to 100 feet of water this time of year, but not a lot. I'm either catching them on super really windy days in on the patches and 15 foot of water, or I'm out 220 to 175, all the way out to, you know, 275 around there, 300 feet. Uh, just depends. So the muttons move around. So the trick is, is knowing where they're going to be at certain times of year. And right now, if you're looking for shallow water mutton snappers, 10 to 15 foot of water, north wind, I believe is the absolute best. North to northeast are my favorites. I'm not a big fan of the southeast wind on the patries. When it's really windy, I just don't, out of the southeast, it muddies up the water. I just don't like it. It's like, I don't like to fish the patches when the wind is out of the southeast and it's warm. I just, I, it's not my favorite. I don't have a lot of luck, at least where I fish. I just, I don't. So I just don't catch as many quality fish on the southeast breeze in on the, on, on the patches from when it's in 10 to 15 foot of water. But when the wind blows out of the north to northeast, that's when I've had my best luck on the patch reefs. Now, certain patches, you got to do your research, fish better on north winds versus north to northeast breezes. And if, if your patch is void of ballyhoo, then you need to move and you need to find the ballyhoo because that's where your muttons are going to be because you need that live bait for them. They may be there, but if you can't get the ballyhoo, then it's not worth sitting and waiting. That's the only time I'll move, okay, unless I've got like a – a different type of charter where, where, it's, where it's catch and release or we're just doing other types of stuff. So break it up. Time of day, very important. Um, either you got to get your chump slick going super early in the morning. I like super early in the morning until like 10 or 11 when I'm, when I'm patching. Or I like to, on full moons, I like the afternoons. I like heading out like 10, like 11 o'clock and fishing until uh, 4.30. Because the, when the bites do happen, it's not like they're biting the entire trip either. So the bites come in flurries, and you got to be on it. So that's when you have to have some live bait in the well. you got to have at least four rods ready because you're going to break one off or something's going to happen or you're going to catch a shark on one and you're going to bust off. So you got to be ready to do the rotation and keep things moving, and that's what I do. So, So... When I was working for this guy, he's like, when we're patch reef fishing, he's like, ah, just put the rod in the rod holder and loosen the drag and with the ballyhoo on and then let the clients go back to catching. And so I continued that over the years. Now, what I found is that is something that you should not be doing. And that's another thing about television is that's, it's, you should not be doing that on the patch reefs. Why? Because you need to feel and work the rod, okay? You need to work your weight over the the sand and the rock. You have to feel the live bait. You have to, like, you got to know what the hell's going on with your bait, okay? So when you stick a rod in the rod holder, okay, and then you loosen the drag and you let it set, what's happening is is the tide is moving your knocker rig across the sand. It could be moving it back towards the boat, creating a big bow in the line, and then your line is going to lay across the rocks. 
and it's already snagged. So when the fish picks up the rod, or I'm sorry, picks up the ballyhoo, he's got a big advantage over you because you got all that slack in the line laying on the bottom, and he's going to break you off. So all that work that you did to get him in and you leave the rod in the rod holder unattended is something that you should not be doing, okay? So how I handle it on my charters. This is when we started catching a lot of fish, okay? Rod and reel control over the live bait. I would, the secret was I would wear my clients out on small fish first to the point that they were done casting. And then typically that allowed the, the mutton snappers to come in and get happy and start eating. Then I'm like, are you guys ready just to kind of take a break, work the big rods, and try to catch some really big mutton snappers? And they're like, they're like, yes. Now, but what the real secret is, is that I would hold the rod, and I would put out the rod. Now, a lot of guys, they don't want to, like, get off the small rods. I don't know why. They're having fun. And then all of a sudden, I'll be holding a rod on my own, and the fish will pick it up, and I'll say, here you go. What do you mean? I was like, you have a giant mutton snapper. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And nine times out of ten, I'm right. And then, boom, those small rods go away, and I start training them on how to work the knocker rig across the sand and feel the current. And keeping your bait active, giving it a little bit of slack, reeling it up on it. You got to keep the slack out of the line. You got to pull the the weight off the bottom so it doesn't snag. You have to keep your your rod tips high so you can feel the the knocker rig. There's a lot more to it. Now, if you're just one of those guys that are setting it in the rod holder and waiting, you might catch one, but you're going to have a problem catching 15. But in the day that that big, really big one hits you're going to be wishing you had a hold of the rod. So you're going to, my, my advice is learn how to control and teach people how to control the ballyhoo on the knocker rig as it slides across the rock and the sand and the sea fans. And once you're, it's like, it does, sometimes your tide is moving away from you and sometimes it's moving out to the side and sometimes your baits are coming back towards the boat, Okay. So there's so, so many different scenarios that when you throw your rod out and then all of a sudden your, your bait's back at your boat and you're like, oh my God, I got a fish on. It's too late. He's going to break you off. Or you're putting it in the outrigger line. And that's another thing. Guides are putting it in the outrigger lines and, and that also creates slack. And, and you, cannot, you don't know where your weight's at. So, or you've like strangled your ballyhoo because it wants to keep going away from the tide and you're not giving it any line. So there's so many different scenarios that work against you. My best advice is to hold the rod and work the, and work the rod. You really got to work it. You really got to feel it. And the mutton bite is very light. You can really, if you're like, if you have like the way that my rods are designed that I can feel everything. And that's why I use braid is because I can feel them pick up the line because I've got enough slack out of uh, slack out of the line to where I can feel them do it. And at that moment, I make sure that my bail's open and I, that way when they grab a hold of it, a mutton eats the bait head first. They have to have time to turn that big ballyhoo around and swallow it and run off with it. So you can get that circle hook set. And so you can put the pressure on them. Very important is rod, rod and reel control with your knocker rig. Setting it in the rod holder is wrong. It's wrong. You might catch one, and it's good for the, the fishermen that really aren't into it, but the guys that are into it, you got to put some time on the rod and the reel. And when you're putting it on the, the outrigger line, that's another thing. It, that works, but not great. So it's extremely hard when your line is hooked up to an outrigger, to tell if your bait's nervous, okay? That's another thing I teach people is that you know when the bite's going to happen. If you've got a ballyhoo on there that's lively, that when I, when I say, okay, you're going to feel that bait get nervous. And when my client learns that, they're like, he's, it's ready. He's, he's coming. He's getting nervous. I'm like, get ready to flip the bail. I go count to three. And once I get them trained on that, they catch one after another after another. You can't do that when your rod's sitting in a rod holder. 
And nine times out of ten, you're going to kill your ballyhoo, and then you know your ballyhoo's going to be out there like <laughs> stiffy, like a stiff ballyhoo waving in the breeze underwater in the current. And the bat, that mutton snapper's down there laughing at you, saying, "Oh, there's another guy up there doesn't know how to do it." So, or he's been watching too much YouTube or too much um, outdoor channel. So. <laughs> I just tell like it is, guys. I'm just here to try to help you guys be better fishermen. And that's, I really do think that that rod and reel control is one of the secrets to mutton snapper fishing. Since I started training my training the clients more and more and putting them on the rod and reel, we started catching 10 times more mutton snappers in shallow than we ever have. And very few of them are rocking us up now. Now, when somebody gets tired of holding the rod, I'll take the rod and say, here, I'll hold it for you. And usually about the time they get tired of holding it is when the fish bites. That's just how it works. It's not like grabbing a sandwich or not looking or going to the bathroom in the bucket. It's just how it rolls, man, or grabbing a soda. So, and then they get back on the rod or they'll grab a rod and they'll start casting again. And it's like, give me back that big rod. And so it's just how it rolls on trips and charters and and I'm sure you guys know. So the guys that have fished with me know how I shallow water mutton fish and have seen the numbers that I post up. But it's taken uh, years of work to get there, a lot of training. And I spent a lot of time with the clients rather than just throwing out that ballyhoo on the bottom and letting it set. So hands-on and being into it and staying alert. It's really going to catch a lot more muttons. And being in tune to the water quality too. Now, sometimes you'll see a shift in the current and then the bite will happen. And then you'll say, oh, okay, well, if you see abnormalities out there and then a bite happens and you need to document it. I really do believe that moon up and moon down too has a lot to do with it. So if the bite's slow, I'll look and say, okay, well, we got to get that moon to set. And a lot of times we get the bites there. It's just how it works. So you got to use those little bits of edges like you're out there wahoo fishing or you're out there sword fishing, which I don't do, but moon up and moon down, all that stuff does funky things with the current and gets fish to eat. And feeding cycles. I strongly believe that fish eat every six hours. So, and that's just what I've seen. So, I'll, who knows? It's just a, it's one of those things I have in my brain that I kind of talk about a little bit here and there, but... I do believe fish ever eat every six hours because they got to like they got to get hungry sooner or later, and just like you and I, sometimes we're really hungry and sometimes we're not, and certain things set us off. We're going to eat a whole bunch and eat in short periods of time, and but anyways, <laughs> you could use my fish every if you know you're out there and then try that every six hour thing. So you just it just you got to have all those things in your brain when you go fishing, especially me, but. Uh, let's try to think what else here I can share with you guys. Chum, we talked about that. Lots of chum. Don't believe what you're hearing about no chum. Try chunking up some ballyhoo in there. You know, scent means a lot. So, um, yeah, scent and chunks of ballyhoo kind of get the spot fired up a little bit more. You don't know what they want. So a lot of chum. And then throw out some chunks of ballyhoo. Use your dead ballyhoo that you've um, used that died on your knocker. Just chunk those up and pepper the pepper the water a little bit. Get a little bit more scent going. See if you can fire them up. Like anything else, sometimes it just takes something just to fire that fire them up a little bit. And sometimes the chunks of of shrimp and and um, chunks of ballyhoo will do that. If you're fishing a patch that you normally catch nice muttons on and it's muddy and you're not catching them, you need to move. Okay, you need to move. You need to find some clean water. So whether that be north or south, but historically you can find clean water. You just got to go look for the color edge. So and you're going to find it. Not everywhere in the Keys is going to be mudded up, so you just got to look. Sometimes if I'm down by alligator and it's muddy, I'll run all the way up the northern Key, I'll run up the Key Largo to find a patch with clean water, and then that's where I'll find them. So, and as far as the patch goes, I like isolated patches in the middle of nowhere. I don't like to fish all that rock out closer to the reef. I like finding nice isolated patches, high-profile patches 
with a lot of mud and sea fans. There, you find the sea fans, you find the mutton snappers. Okay, mutton snappers love sea fans. They like to be there. You find a patch that's like all sea fans, you're you're good to go, man. You're going to catch a lot of big muttons. So if you have an area that you like to lobster in the summer and it's got sea fans on it, go back there and see if you can't get the muttons because I can almost guarantee you that they're there. So, but I'm out of time and I got to go. I've talked a lot. So I hope you guys have pulled some information out of what I've said here and sorted through it and hope you guys can piece it together. I, I got a couple things that I'm going to be launching here pretty soon that will have some videos and some tutorials, some tutorials, mini seminars that are going to be available for purchase. So, but stay tuned for that as I release those. And also within the mini seminars, there's going to be GPS locations that you can target that you cannot find on the maps. So I've been thinking about this for many years and I'm finally doing it. So it's taken some time because I want to do it right. And after watching thousands of fishing shows over the course of the years, I'm like, this is going to be something you guys are going to get some something out of with and with a lot of education. So, and best yet, because we have the Sea Keeper, the boat's not going to be going up and down on the, on the television or on the video that you're going to watch. It's stabilized and with some great stuff. So you'll just have to stay tuned because I got some cool people that are going to be involved with it, just not me. So it's something different. And I think that the world needs something different right now because from what I'm seeing, it just needs something different. So that's all I got. I'm out of time. You guys have a good one. And remember, anytime you're fishing, it's all good.